We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Uh, welcome the few present here in the hall. Welcome to the world community of uh, internet viewers uh, who are attending this session on Are We All E-Wasted? Uh, we are here at the Internet Governance Forum in Katowice, Poland, and this is a production together with our host, our Polish hosts, and the Museum of Communication in Bern, capital of Switzerland. Um, are we all e-wasted is today's topic. And the issue is that wireless digitalization bears many advantages. It also has a couple of nicks. And one of those nicks is the, in, is the increasing amount of e-waste that we produce through digitalizing our lives. And we will have a panel discussion uh, under the head of the Swiss delegation at this international conference, uh, Mr. Bernhard Meissen, who is the Director General of the Federal Office for Communication. Uh, but before, we will look at what the Museum of Communication in Bern, Switzerland has to offer. And um, we will now uh, look at this, um, at their movie and and, the, and their show, and I produce over, handing over to Christian Rohner in Switzerland. Christian, are you there? Hello, Switzerland. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will immediately start our nice little film. Hi, good afternoon and welcome to Bern, the capital of Switzerland. My name is Veronika and I am a communicator, the name we give to cultural mediators here at the Museum für Kommunikation. As your host today and on behalf of my team, Alexandra, Christian, Yuri and Thomas, I would like to welcome you to this e-visit. The fact that we can be here with you today is only possible because of the great information and technology revolution we are living in. However, this same revolution has caused an exponential increase in new technology and therefore an increased volume in obsolete products. And so we are right in the topic, e-waste. As you know, e-waste is one of the fastest growing waste streams. 50 million tons of e-waste are produced worldwide in one year we absolutely must address this worldwide problem. And we believe real dialogue is the key to beginning this change, just as you do now at the Internet Governance Forum. The Museum of Communication, with all its staff, is really interested in living, immediate and real communication. Since 2017, we do more than just collect and retell stories. What we want to do is actually talk and initiate a dialogue. But why don't we just begin this e-visit and show you. Thomas, my fellow communicator, is already waiting for you inside. Thomas, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Veronica. I can hear you. Thanks for the introduction. Behind me, you can see the entrance of our main exhibition, the heart of our museum. Let me just log in.
Here at the museum, we take a look at all sorts of communication. Whether it's sending a message through the pneumatic tube, finding a path through our maze in Ensemble, reenacting our favorite movie scenes, or having a virtual conversation. Hi, I'm Mike. In our exhibition, it's impossible not to communicate. Communication has always connected people. But why do we communicate and with whom? What does it take to really understand each other? Each year, 100,000 people find their way into our museum. A lot of families, children, and young people. And we, the communicators, personally take care of these guests. We initiate dialogues, we make suggestions, we talk to them, and if necessary, we show them how they use the equipment. Wenn der Kopf oben ist, dann erzähle ich euch eine Geschichte zum Objekt im Museum. Und wenn die Zahl oben ist, dürft ihr euch ein Objekt aussuchen und mir eine Geschichte erzählen. Vor 80 Jahren ist das gefahren und das war sehr langsam. Today, you are our visitors. Today, we are interested in initiating a sustainable dialogue with you on a topic that's part of our next exhibition. For that, I'd like to hand over the floor to my colleague, Alexandra. Alexandra, can you hear me? Hi, Thomas. Yes, I can hear you. Can you tell us what the exhibition is about? It's an exhibition about the environmental crisis and e-waste will be one of the topics. Okay, so we'll hear more details on that exhibition later on. But for now, the title of this e-visit is Are we all e-wasted? Alexandra, can you tell us what that means? Let me try and answer this question with a question for you all in the audience in Katowice. How many of you have come to the conference without a mobile phone. Not many, right? Well, you're not alone. Over the last 20 years, mobile phones and vast access to the internet have made many things easier for us. Not at least communication. But this comes at a price. The resources we use to build these devices cause many environmental and social problems. And after we're done, using the devices, they turn into e-waste. Of course, mobile phones are only one example for devices that eventually turn into e-waste. However, they are one of the most visible and omnipresent. You could say that we carry a part of the problem in our pocket every day. So Thomas, could you tell us some facts about this problem? Here are the facts. Swiss people buy a new smartphone every 16 months. We're world champion in the production of e-waste. A hundred years ago, in Switzerland, there were a bit more than three telephones for every 100 inhabitants. By 1980, that figure had already risen to 70. Today, there are now 126 mobile phones for every 100 Swiss inhabitants. Surveys suggest that today, at the age of 10, half the children have a smartphone. By the age of 12, almost everybody is online. Alexandra, can you imagine? I only know one single person that doesn't own a mobile phone. My grandma. 
She says she's too old to waste her time with the internet. But she's always very happy to see family photos on my phone when I visit. Thomas, how many people are using a phone right now? Worldwide, over three and a half billion people use a smartphone today. There are over 20 cell phone manufacturers who are always bringing new models on the market. Today, over one billion smartphones are sold each year. Instead of increasing, life cycles of devices are shortening. Metals, such as lead, arsenic and mercury, are accumulating and contaminating our environment. Toxic e-waste often ends up on landfills in countries with inadequate infrastructure because they are not properly disposed of. Child labor, for example, in the gathering of raw materials, is still omnipresent today. Thanks for the facts, Thomas. I just hear that Veronica has something to say on the subject. I mean, I don't know how it is for you, but for me, the sheer number and facts are just so overwhelming that sometimes it just seems too abstract. That's why I like to hear personal stories from our visitors. Whenever I do a guided tour, for example, I always ask the school children to tell me how many mobile phones they have had until now. The most impressive answer came from a 13-year-old boy who said he was already on his mobile phone number eight. Isn't that impressive? <laughs> yeah, I have to admit, this is my eighth mobile phone. And in the context of this, I have the first question for you. How many mobile phones have you owned until today? Think about it. I give you one minute. I wonder what happens with all the phones that are not being used anymore. I'm going to ask someone who certainly knows about one option. Yuri is the curator of our collection. He focuses on objects connected with information and communication technologies, ICT. Because we can only show a small part of all collected objects here in the exhibitions, the Museum of Communication has a depot. 
The depot is our large storage area with thousands of objects documenting the history of communication in Switzerland over the last 100 years. Yuri is one of 10 people who work with our collection. Hello? Hello? Ah, oh, hi Alexandria. Hey Yuri, question for you. How many different telephones do we have in the museum collection? Here in the collection we have over 2000 telephones. The oldest dates from the late 19th century and this one here is from the late 90s. <laughs> There are analog and digital devices. There are rotary dials and push buttons and telephones of different materials and shapes. This one, for example, is a telephone from the late 19th century. It's probably made of local wood from near Bern and the microphone is imported. Mm -hmm. This is the classic Swiss telephone from the post-war period. It was used in some cases for over 50 years. And this one here is the first Swiss mobile phone. It was launched in 1978 and it was very expensive. We are talking about 10,000 Swiss francs. And Yuri, how did all these phones end up in a museum collection? The base is the collection of the former state-owned Swiss Postal, Telegraph and Telephone Agency. However, we receive weekly offers of objects from private individuals. It's therefore important to make a wise selection and to document the objects well. A museum needs only one device of each model. And let's be honest, it is probably the most unusual way mm -hmm. for a used device to end up in a museum collection. And Yuri, what other ways are there to address this problem? You can keep the phone as long as possible. For example, let me tell you a story. This cell phone was used by a person from 1998 until the shutdown of the Swisscom GSM network in February 2021. One cell phone in 23 years. This phone still works perfectly, but the required mobile phone standard no longer exists in Switzerland. However, this phone is an exception. Supply and demand regulate this differently. Smartphones technology is more complex. Repairs of smartphones are often hardly worthwhile. The battery loses its performance or a new operating system is no longer compatible with the device, which compromises data security. And advertising promises a new happy experience with every new smartphone. Thanks, Yuri, and best regards to Schwarzenburg. There are many different reasons why people buy a new mobile phone. And that leads us to two more questions for you, dear audience. The first one is, why did you replace your old mobile with a new one?
And now to the question that leads us back to the issue of e-waste. What did you do with your old phone after you were done using it? I handed my old phone in at an electronics collection point. If reuse no longer makes sense, phones can be recycled. Christian, the question is almost programmatic. Could you have prevented the waste? Yes or no? Well, Christian, could you? Actually, as a part of the solution, when we talk about waste, here at the museum, we try to create awareness. And with this little irritation, we create awareness. Could you have prevented this waste? Yes or no? When you never think about it, you're never gonna change your throwing away habits. In front of our lovely museum, a lot of people are eating lunch. Now let's have a look in these two bins. First in the no bin. I could not have prevented this waste. But come on, you're not serious, are you? You really need so much packaging for your sandwich? Aluminium could be brought to the recycling station. A lot of waste could have been avoided by just changing your buying habits. But I know it's not very easy when you're in a rush at lunchtime. I was very happy when I read that the EU forbids one-way coffee cups, like this one, by 2030. You can change habits very efficiently with the law too. Now let's have a look into the yes bin. I could have prevented that waste. Wow, that brings us back to our main topic, e-waste. If you don't use your electronic devices anymore, you have different kinds of possibilities. If it still works, you offer your mobile phone on an online marketplace. If you are not familiar with this kind of websites, there are companies that follow the reuse business model. They collect mobile phones to make them functional again. You see? Hello? Hi Christian, it's Alexandra. And what can we do with phones that are beyond repair? When mobile phones can no longer be made functional, it is essential to recycle them. In Switzerland, when you buy a mobile phone, the cost of disposal is mostly already included in the price. Suico and Sense Recycling are non-profit systems for taking back old electronic and electrical equipment. Let me give you an example. This is the bill of the fridge I recently bought. On the bottom you can see the fee of recycling. You only have to bring it to any electronic dealer in Switzerland. 
and they have to recycle it because you already paid for it. Sweetland Sense started their business in the 90s as a vision and today they are internationally respected role models for take-back systems. We need exactly these kinds of success stories to make progress on e-waste. Alexandra will tell you now more about our next exhibition in the Museum of Communication. Alexandra, can you hear me? Here, next year's exhibition will take place. What you see now is our current exhibition, Super. It revolves around digitalization, biotechnology and self-optimization. A lot of the technology that we show here, for example, this e-girlfriend, will eventually turn into e-waste. The same can happen to the devices that we use to show content. This is an issue that we, as a museum, must recognize. The Museum of Communication is on a path to become more sustainable. And as we work to raise the public's awareness for sustainability, we will become more aware ourselves. All the material and devices used here will be reused and recycled for next year's exhibition. Environmental concerns will be as important as aesthetic concerns in the design of our next exhibition. Planetopia will be about environmental crises like climate change and a potential biodiversity collapse. The most important question we deal with is with what we as a society can do to stop them. We believe that talking and listening to one another is key to engage with environmental challenges ahead. We want to be a museum that actively participates in public discourse and that helps to stop the destruction of our planet. Preparations are already in full swing and we already started our dialogue just like me and Veronica. Thank you, Alexandra. Dear e-visitors, on behalf of my team, Alexandra, Christian, Yuri and Thomas, we'd like to thank you for your attention and wish you a successful conference. Now it's your turn. I invite you to turn to your neighbor and continue the conversation. The sustainable dialogue has begun. Are we all e-wasted? Let's see if this works. Christian and the whole team, can you hear me in Bern? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Pablo. Excellent. Well, I can't see you. Maybe uh, our friends can bring you on the screen. Let's see if that works. There you are. Nice to see you. Thank you so much for the tour. That was wonderful. You're welcome. <laughs> it's a pity that the polls apparently didn't work, but we'll maybe um, get to that later on. Um, first of all, thank you very much. That was very impressive. I wanted to um, have a few minutes with you and the audience online and here in Katowice to see if there are questions. For all those online, you can ask your questions in the chat and uh, the team here at the Museum for Communication in Bern will be happy to answer them. To get you started, I would like to ask one myself, which is what's the reaction of uh, the people who visit the Museum of Communication in Bern when they come to this little corner that you have dedicated to e-waste? Veronica will uh, answer the question. Thank you, Veronica. I will try, at least. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it, it really depends a lot on, on the age group, I think. It's, uh, it, we try not to moralize and not to tell it's right or wrong. Whatever answer they give us is correct. And what we try to say is that it takes awareness mostly to have a little bit of um, intuition and to see, are we doing all that we can? And most people are very, very 
uh, impressed with the when they start looking at the number they themselves have of mobile telephones. Sometimes they don't even know that they can recycle them. And we also touched the issue about emotional attachment to their um, telephones or old machinery. Sometimes they stay at home and we don't recycle them because we have a certain emotional attachment to them. So that's something that we also have to take uh, into consideration. I can think of a few old mobile phones that are still in my home. I don't know if I'm emotionally attached, but they are still sticking around, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned this upfront recycling system, this upfront recycling fee that we have in Switzerland, uh, where when you buy the device, you already pay a fee for the uh, later recycling of this uh, same device. Are people that come to the exhibition usually aware that they can bring back all their electronics at the sales point or at any sales point for recycling and that they already paid for that themselves? Thomas has an answer for you, Paul. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Well, when I ask, some people are astonished that it is a, that this is a possibility. So um, some people know, some don't. Um, as you saw, it's not a very old system. It's not established everywhere. Um, maybe the fee is so low that you just don't realize when you buy a, an electronic device that it's already included. But there's definitely more work to be done so that people realize that this is a possibility and they already paid for. Thank you. Let's see if we have some questions in, in the chat. For those of you participating online, feel free to put your questions in the chat. In the meantime, I want to know more about your t-shirts. We saw some of them in the video. I know that, uh, Christian, you're telling the truth, right? Can you tell us a bit about those t-shirts? Yeah, all our communicators uh, wear a T-shirt like that and they, they have their name on it that you really can uh, know with whom you're talking with. And they have a front, but they also have a back. So you really have to do uh, uh, sometimes a turnaround to see uh, what is on the front is uh, meaning. In my case, yeah, it, uh, it's a little bit... Uh, Ambiguous. <laughs> so what's on your t-shirt, Veronica? Um, well, mine says in French, celle-ci n'est pas une communicatrice. And it's a little bit of uh, a play with uh, celle-ci n'est pas une pipe from Magritte because I'm wearing it and I'm saying that I'm not a communicator, but actually I am. And I don't really know what's on my back. <laughs> <laughs> I've got your back. <laughs> after all, I am here for you after all. <laughs> Excellent. What about the other two? Can you show us? Yeah. Um, mine says in German, um, in reality, reality is different. Um, it doesn't work well in English because we don't have two different words for that. But um, I chose this um, sentence because I'm a curator and I want to see um, that people can uh, look at our world in with different perspectives and I work to that and I'm afraid my back is in English and it's a little bit rude <laughs> your favorite word is fudge <laughs> thank you very much you wanted to know Paolo <laughs> I did so last t-shirt as you know uh, translated that would mean something like well if you're not around it's your own fault and uh, on my back, I actually don't, don't know. Maybe you can tell me. My friends live in my computer. Uh, I think that's uh, a bit close to home for all of us now during the <laughs> pandemic. And I, I guess that the Churchill quote for your T-shirt would have been, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? Wow. wow. Well, yeah, exactly. Thanks. I've got one of those for every occasion, mind you. Anyway, so we, we, we don't have a question in the chat right now, but maybe one from the audience here in Katowice. Yes, please. Um, try it out. Otherwise, I'll um, paraphrase it for you. It doesn't seem to work. So I'll, I'll paraphrase it for you. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll tell the, the, the friends in Bern about your question. As you wish. Oops. 
Hello. Hi. I just want to say um, what you're doing is really good. And um, I hope a lot of countries will um, uh, do what you're doing. Uh, my name is Ave and I'm from the Philippines. And the thing is, I never heard something like this before. And it's very interesting in what you're doing to know if are there other groups or countries that does this in Asia? So that, yes, the recycling fee. Or if not, do you know anyone where, because I live very far, Philippines is very far. And is there a way where we can donate even our old phones to someone who can use it, especially in the pandemic. Not a lot of children uh, has access to cell phones for, for them to be able to study. Do you know anyone that is near the Philippines or not just there, but who does these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, um, I'll try to answer your question as best as I can. <laughs> To be honest, we're not too familiar with um, the situation in Asia. Um, there is a European initiative to um, establish systems of prepaid recycling fees um, in other European countries. For example, in Ireland, they have something very different. But as far as I'm aware, um, they are quite um, in early stages still. And to your other question, I think we do have um, some charities here in Switzerland that collect old phones and try to make them functionable uh, for people in other parts of the world. But to be honest, I don't have a name for you at the moment. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? In that case, well, thank you very much. We will continue here in Katowice with the panel discussion, and we look forward to hearing more from you from the Museum of Communication in Bern, especially your next exhibition, Planetopia. Really looking forward to that. And this video that you produced, especially for the Internet Governance Forum, will also be available on YouTube. Is that right? That's right, yeah. It will be on the YouTube channel of uh, the Museum of Communication. And I think it will be also available on other channels. Fantastic. So we can follow you and we'll have your video. And on behalf of the Embassy of Switzerland in Poland, I'd uh, like to thank you for uh, doing this tour, for making your video available and for joining us here in Katowice live from Bern. Thank you very much to the whole team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Bye. Bye. And with this, I'd like to ask our panelists to the stage, if you um, will join me. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope all the microphones work, otherwise we'll pass it around, but um, we'll start with uh, Bernard Meissen. Um, you are the director of Switzerland's uh, Federal Office of Communications in Bern. You're also the head of the Swiss delegation here at the UN Internet Governance Forum in Katowice. And of course, the Internet Governance Forum, as the name says, is all about the governance questions around the internet. How relevant is a topic like e-waste for this forum and for the multilateral discussions that you will be having here? Yes, um, uh, microphone is working. Thank you for this question. At um, the Swiss government, uh, we consider uh, the interlinkage between digitalization and environment sustainability highly important because it's uh, two topics are in the really something that we think it's important to go forward in this way. And you, you saw uh, in this video uh, a little bit how it is yet working in Switzerland, because we see uh, the internet and other digital technologies um, 
such as, for example, um, blockchain, uh, or artificial intelligence can pose uh, challenges to the environment, for example, in terms of uh, energy, the consumption of energy, and as you see, the, the e-waste. On the other hand, um, there's also the hope that the digital te technologies uh, can help us to protect the environment, for example, through innovat innovations and tools that allow for collecting environmental data, fathering more efficient use of energy and other uh, things. And the IGF, we think and we believe it, is ideally placed to discuss the quickly emerging intersection of environment and digitalization and to shed more light on the interplay between uh, these two uh, megatrends we see all over the world. Thanks to its bottom-up um, IGF, the truly multi-stakeholder ap approach to the policy discussions, um, IGF can act as a main place where uh, to forge alliance, to network, to, to develop tangible uh, outcomes and to address uh, these challenges. So we are very glad uh, that IGF um, is putting this topic and we see it as uh, very relevant. Thank you. We'll continue at the other end of our um, little panel. Um, Justina Szczepanik, uh, you're a member of the University of Warsaw Advisory Team for Climate and Sustainable Development. And you're also a coordinator of the EIT Climate Kick, which is short for Knowledge and Innovation Community. Um, how important is this topic of e-waste uh, and of the sustainability aspects of digitalization for the University of Warsaw? And maybe also what kind of solutions have come out of uh, your work there? First of all, I would like to thank Swiss Embassy uh, for inviting me uh, to this event. I'm really happy to see that uh, e-waste topic is uh, so important and um, ma so many people are interested in sustainable digitalization. Also very important to University of Warsaw. Um, we, had, uh, we have uh, recently announced an agenda for climate change and sustainable development, which has defined our objectives um, for the upcoming years. Uh, one of the milestones is to achieve um, sustainable consumption by 2025, uh, sorry. And we will aim to extend um, the life of electronic devices uh, by buying equipment which could be repaired uh, for as long as possible. Uh, so we're also going to create an online platform um, to facilitate the exchange of, of uh, electronic devices, equipment and office supplies um, among our employees and students. It's a quite large community. And furthermore, uh, the University of Warsaw um, has become uh, the first university of, in Poland, uh, ha uh, which has joined the Race to Zero initiative. Um, this initiative is supported by the United Nations. Um, those involved in this campaign uh, pledge uh, to take immediate um, action to halt uh, greenhouse gas emission by 2030. So I hope we will make effort to limit our negative impact on the climate and uh, on the environment. Thank you, Justina. And we'll continue with uh, Florina Vashpi, who is also part of the Swiss delegation. Uh, you are a researcher at the Bern University of Applied Sciences, and you're also an independent consultant in the IGF Policy Network on the Environment. What's the role of this policy network? 
Thank you so much. First of all, I also want to thank a lot for the invitation. As you said, I am from Bern or I live in Bern at the moment and I often go visit the Museum of Communication and it's a real pleasure to be here with the colleagues from Bern. I feel very honored. Uh, thanks also for the great movie. I hope that inspires many of you if you ever come to Switzerland to also visit the museum. And to answer your question, yes, you're right. So I'm also a researcher at the Bern University of Applied Sciences um, and also consulting a new network uh, that's called Network on Environment and Digitalization. That's a new intercessional initiative of the IGF that's basically been born out of the huge interest that the topic of environment and digitalization was met with at the IGF last year. So that was when the decision was taken with support of the Swiss Office of Communication to launch into this new uh, venture or new policy network. And we actually have our session this Thursday, December 9th, where we will present a report that we've been working on for the last uh, month, which is about basically how we can use digitalization to use um, to, to achieve the sustainable development goals that many UN member states have set for themselves. And with regard to the topic of e-waste, I think that's relevant for many of the subjects that we discuss in our report. So we've chosen to focus on one environmental data um, food and water systems, supply chain, circularity and transparency and overarching issues. Could you maybe give us an example from uh, that report uh, that you've prepared, something that really struck you? Sure. So one thing is we've been working with the multi-stakeholder working group where we also have representatives of the EU Commission. One is Ilias Jakovidis, who's working for DigiConnect, and he's been very helpful in discussing with us the possibility for a digital product passport. So for me, I don't know, maybe our colleagues from research can also tell us if that's a subject for them. But at least for me, that was something I found very interesting. And I'm hoping that other countries will join the efforts of the EU Commission. So this idea of establishing a product passport, similarly as for human beings, we have a passport to identify where we're from and important um, characteristics. Similarly, we could imagine a world where we have a passport for products. So helping consumers know where a product is from, how it can be recycled, just creating more awareness. So for me, that could be one instrument that we could push for and could which could help raise awareness for e-waste as well, because I think there's a lot of knowledge missing still for us um, to know, as we've heard in this movie, um, where is a product coming from and what's really involved, like what emissions are involved in the creation of a product. Thank you. And last but not least, Sofia Pivovarek, uh, you are the head of development at the UN Global Compact Network here in Poland. The Global Compact, of course, is an initiative by the United Nations to mobilize private businesses for sustainability and for human rights. How do you address a topic like e-waste in the Global Compact Network? So, first of all, I would like to thank you, the Swiss Embassy, for having me today. And I also need to mention that UN Global Compact, like the, like the whole UN system, we believe that topic E-waste uh, e topic is very important and is still um, skipped in the discussion. Um, so, and also I need to mention that in the UN, in UN system, we love the numbers and statistics. So that is why I will prepare for you today some, um, during my speech, uh, some science-based um, UN reports and statistics, statistics they, um, they contain. So when I will over be over time, just let me know because in UN system we talk a lot. So please let me know. Uh, so global consumption of electrical and electronic equipment is on the rise. In recent years, the United Nations has committed itself progressively to addressing the problem of e-waste uh, as essential to the 20 and 30 development sustainable agenda. And I really need to highlight the need for strong collaboration among United Nations organization. And I would like to introduce you, but I'm pretty sure that uh, all our uh, distinguished guests know the, uh, this, this group. 
the, the group is called the Issue Management Group on Tackling E-Waste. This is the over 20 organization active in tackling a waste have undertaken over 150 e-waste initiative since 2004. Also, there is one very important uh, report that it was issued this year, uh, last year, sorry. And the name of the report is the Global e-waste Monitor 2020. Report found the world dump a record 15 free, 0.6 million tons of e-waste last year, which is enough to form a line 125 kilometers long. That's an increase of 21% in five years. From the other side, at the same time, the amount of e-waste we collect and recycle has increased globally from 70% up to 70 point four percent it's not as much as we expected i think so even countries with a formal e-waste management system in place are confronted with their relatively low collection and recycling rates so in poland nowadays the rates is around 60 percent so it plays poland in the um, the global e-waste monitor index at seven place how it looks um, e-waste management system and how many we produced. So in China, according to the report, of course, in China with 10.1 million tons was the biggest contributor to e-waste and the United States was second with 6.9 million tons. India with 3.2 million tons was third. So these three countries together accounted for nearly 28% of the world e-waste last year. The amount is really huge. And for me, it's very surprisingly. So while the overall damage done to environment from the UN recycled waste may be incalculable, the way in which we produce, consume, and dispose of e-waste is as sustainable. And the last very threatening uh, amount, so is 98 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents were released into the atmosphere as a resu result of inadequate recycling and of, of course, undocumented refrigerated and air conditioners. So last UN reports for today, <laughs> promise. So, uh, the report United Nations system wide response to tacking e-waste, which we also issued last year too. Members of the issue management group on tacking e-waste clearly said, there is still less attention among companies paid to, second, reduction of e-waste and poor practices during the design and on the production stages. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And also thank you for the impressive numbers. Um, so if I heard correctly, 53.6 million tons of e-waste globally, right? Yeah. Out of which 70% is recycled now. Yeah, unfortunately, yes. And we already know that this amount will increase this year, unfortunately, because of the pandemic. Because we're all at home, we need even more devices and, um, and we, we, we want a new one uh, to keep us happy and connected with our friends and family. Thank you for that, Sophia. And uh, Bernard Meissen, um, if, is e-waste an important topic for the Swiss government that you represent here as head of delegation? And also um, beyond the mandatory recycling fee that we heard about from the museum in Bern, um, what else is Switzerland doing to manage e-waste? Yes, thank you um, for this question. As we heard these uh, numbers, uh, very impressive numbers. Um, I don't know on which place uh, Switzerland is uh, on the recycling list. Um, Check later. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think as you see, uh, e-waste is to become the fastest growing waste stream worldwide. And so we really need to, to make something against that. And Switzerland has implemented various uh, measures to regulate e-waste management. Um, you heard uh, in the video uh, about, about this uh, fee. Um, 
we uh, these measures start with a strong and uh, convenient voluntary uh, take back system i think that's the very important it's voluntary and it's quite normal to to take back the the things you don't need anymore but consumers they, they can take it uh, to dedicated recycling collection points and any electronic shop takes it back so it's really easy when you buy a new th thing um, bring back the old and uh, when it comes really normal then it's a, a big step forward in this direction but it's i think it's not enough um Special disposal companies in Switzerland uh, process e-waste by uh, first removing the batteries and the potential dangerous components, and then sorting, shredding, separating um, them into the different components, uh, parts, then metals, plastics, glass, all the other materials. Uh, that's uh, quite a important work. And so up to 70% of uh, these components can be recycled. I think that's uh, also very important. And then uh, Switzerland established uh, regulations to prevent illegally dumping of e-waste to developing uh, nations because uh, it's always an easy way. Um, it's away from Switzerland. It's far away. It, the problem is uh, resolved. And so we tried really to make a uh, strong regulation that is not possible. And so uh, Swiss government um, it's uh, importing such uh, waste materials to countries that are not uh, in the EU or OECD. So it's prohibited. It needs really uh, such a law to, to avoid uh, this problem. And so uh, I think of 15 years uh, now, Switzerland um, is uh, actively encouraging to supporting uh, environment friendly electronic and electronic waste disposal and practice in other countries uh, so that's uh, that's the way we try but overall i think um, it needs really to consider the entire life cycle to the devices and uh, from the designer to the to the user uh, everybody has really to think about uh, what's going on and uh, when we, it, it's also a part of education that we get something that's normal that we see. Okay, it's part of uh, of all this life cycle. It starts not uh, when I buy it, and it's, it stops not to when I don't use it anymore. It starts much earlier and it ends uh, much later, and so it will go forward in in the good direction. Thank you. And there are also development cooperation projects, right? So in countries like Peru or Ghana, the State Secretariat for Economic Affairs is supporting them in handling e-waste that they inherit from other countries. Yes, uh, it's also a project we try um, in these countries. We have a lot um, the countries you mentioned, and we are looking forward to uh, find other countries for make this uh, this experience. Thank you very much. And over to Justina. Uh, what role can innovation play to make uh, our digital lives more uh, sustainable? Um, you are working as a coordinator for the EIT Climate Kick. Um, what kind of uh, support can you give for innovation in this field of uh, e-waste and sustainability in the digital space? Um, innovation is essential, uh, but there is always, always a but. Um, not as we have doing it now. And this is the problem. Uh, we need a new model of innovation, a model uh, which uh, can harness the power and the dynamics of the whole system to catalyze the much deeper and faster changes. Um, and EIT Climate Kick uh, is a climate innovation agency um, working to catalyze these trans uh, transformations. So um, they using system innovation as a portfolio. And uh, thanks to that, uh, they um, create uh, new tools how we could change the whole system. And they are assuming that no one has all the answers and all the solutions. 
uh, needed to meet the climate emergency. So we need to uh, work together and uh, build a, a whole portfolio of projects where innovation is key tool. And they treat innovation, education, and entrepreneurship um, as fully integrated activities uh, working in combination in a system innovation portfolio. So we could um, merge this together and tackle, uh, <laughs> merge this together, sorry. EIT Climate Kick is, um, in other words, EIT Climate Kick is mapping the system to identify where and how the innovation could um, play a role uh, to in catalyzing change dynamics. So they start to design relevant um, some of the leverage points and uh, address the opportunities and the barriers. So the aim is to drive climate adaptation and uh, resilience through cir circular economy approaches and to generate new business models uh, to achieve um, Paris goals. Can you give us one example, a uh, specific example from... Uh, yeah, for example, uh, this uh, climate kick uh, have, uh, has a large project called Deep Demonstrations. Deep Demonstration is uh, quite an initiative to um, change the policy, the management uh, and the, for example, in education system, how we could change the policy management uh, at schools and um, how we could um, grow awareness about e-waste, about cir circular economy. If we um, could, build the trust of society and young generations and uh, is, and give some examples how we could change the law. We could um, merge this to be more sustainable. Uh, this digitalization um, should be um, finished by 2030 if we want to achieve the climate goals. So deep demonstrations are quite uh, difficult uh, projects, but they, uh, if they achieve the goal, we could use them as a really um, key to, to um, be more sustainable. Thank you. And Sofia Pivovarek, um, you're working with companies as part of uh, the, the mission of the UN Global Compact. What are the most promising initiatives by Polish companies to manage e-waste? Since you uh, told us that um, the recycling rate here is still quite low at around 60% compared to a global average of 70%, what kind of initiatives are sticking out here? Uh, thank you very much that you highlighted that um, UN Global Compact um, was created in 2010 by Kofi Annan, UN Secretary General, to cooperate uh, business. And nowadays we help business to meet the development goal too. Um, so on our daily discussion, um, we have heard from the business from the electronic industry, the companies from the electronic uh, company, uh, once again, companies from the electronic industry that they understand the e-waste management system problems. Um, they knew that they need to do something with it, but they have no 
perfect solution. And I think that there is no perfect solution for it. And we need to really find it. And also the representative of the electronic industry prepared this year report. The report indicates, sorry, I told you that there, there will be a lot of numbers. <laughs> so the report indicates that 40, uh, 440,000 tons of new household appliances were in Poland in 2020. Producers were obliged to collect a recycle around uh, 230,000 tons of, of waste equipment. It is according to uh, your regulation, so all the panelists know uh, the, the, the issue. And it is more than a half of the mass of all electro waste collection in Poland. So the number is quite good. But nowadays in our home in Poland, we have up to 13 million devices. So the potential for the, for the recovery is huge. And also in UN Global Compact, we connect business with academia. So also we think that the cooperation between academia and business is very important in waste, uh, waste uh, topic. Sometimes the result of the collaboration might be surprising. A Martian vehicle made of electro waste, do you heard about it? Uh, students of the Kielce University of Technology faced such a challenge. And last year, um, as it turns out, they coped the new tax, uh, task extremely effectively. So of course, business is now very interested in this project. So I need to also say that there is no longer business in usual in Poland. And revolution, revolutionary transformation is needed. Um, it is technology possible for us to product uh, to produce items that are durable, modular, easy to repair, and designed for the recovery of raw materials. And also it was mentioned in the movie today. And Polish business understand it. And it will be a little more expensive to produce a, uh, in a new way, but the result is worth it. Uh, a washing machine would not work for a few years, but a dozen. The average annual cost of ownership for the customers would be much lower uh, and the problems with waste would be smaller. So also there's a lot of good practices for the consumers. Um, and also I need to say that in a movie and also Yuslina mentioned that um, education um, and the customers' education is very needed in Poland because um, I think Polish people don't understand uh, how disposes of used electronics. So also there is one very important issue that the companies uh, in Poland faced is shadow economy. And I understand that it's a very, very difficult topic. And you and Global Compact, we counter counteracting shadow economy for many years in very in very different industry, but in electronic um, equipment industry too. So fight against the shadow economy uh, is important for the Polish economy, but also for the Polish edu education system. Why? Every fifth Poles disposes of used electronic and household appliances illegally. Instead of in special containers of ele electro waste, they usually end up in garbage cans. And it, this is extremely harmful to the environment. We we'll, we'll already know it, and it's very good. It's first step, I think. So used equipment contains many poison substances and metals there is still no systematic supervision of how much and what type of procedures electronic equipment is reinterred in the market and whether it, uh, it meets and any safety standards. And we know that the Polish government is also interested in 
cont uh, counteracting the shadow economy in Poland. Of course, and we already know that the main reason is significant, significant uh, damage uh, to the environment, but it also means to return over 750 million złotych to the Polish budget every year. So thank you very much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we'll uh, be curious also to see how this decision of uh, Apple uh, on the right uh, to repair uh, will play out in the industry and also um, on, the, on the Polish market, of course. Now, finally, to Florina Vashby again. E-waste, of course, is a global problem, and um, you're also trying to work on global solutions. So how um, will you be able to, to shape such solutions in the framework of the IGF? Thank you. Yeah, so a couple of points. So I wanted to add to what my colleague has said on that we need a new model of innovation. And I think you're very right. And I would like to suggest to add to that, that we also need a new way of thinking about responsibility, because I think e-waste or the problem of e-waste has a lot to do with how the global responsibility is assumed or rather not assumed. So I think, or I would uh, very much in the context of the report and also in the context of just in general, the problems we are facing today suggests or hope that we can in the future shape a new paradigm of how we think about who is responsible for waste. Because as of now, still a lot of the responsibility is always placed or shifted towards the consumers. So us who buy these technologies. And of course we are responsible, but in a way I think we should, if evolve towards a model where the responsibility for waste really is with the consumers of these products as well. And to, I think we've, um, my colleagues touched upon this as well, that there is designed like into the, a lot of devices, the waste is already designed into in a way because it's impossible to recycle them or reuse them when they go default. And so I think that's one problem. And um, Mr. Meissner has touched upon the difficulty and complexity of recycling e-waste as well. And I think that's an important point to stress in the global context that a lot of countries, especially those where the e-waste is ending up currently, don't actually have the competence or the knowledge or the financial resources to really um, recycle these that e-waste that is ending up there. So even if Switzerland may not send out e-waste uh, in the global south anymore, it's still happening, right? So in a global, from a global perspective, we could think about how can we support the countries to be able to recycle the e-waste that they're having to deal with, which is in a way a global inequality and yeah, it's not fair to a lot of uh, regional communities that didn't ask for that kind of toxic waste. But at the same time, I think that's just a symptom, right, of the underlying problems that we're facing or that are responsible for e-waste in a way which is overconsumption and overproduction. So both of these issues we should also talk about and address and not stay on the question of how do we recycle e-waste, but rather ask ourselves, as we did in the film, how can we address the problem of us consuming so much and generating so much electronic waste? Thank you very much. So the, uh, the moral of the story, of course, is reduce, reuse and recycle. And I'm already um, on a positive note here because we're recycling 70%. Uh, I hope that you will contribute to us getting to the 99 or 100%. I wish you best of luck in your ventures. Thank you very much on behalf of the Embassy of Switzerland in Poland for joining us here today. Bernard Meissen, Florina Vashby, Sofia Pivovarek, and Justina Szczepanik. I'm sorry, my pronunciation is still very bad. I'll get there. <laughs> Thank you very it's much. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Trying hard. Thank you and all the best.